Welcome to Governing Pandemics 101. We'll speak about the Pandemic Treaty today as part of the Governing Pandemics concept. I'm Haik Nikogosian. I'm a senior fellow at the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva, the organizer of this course. And I am also the former head of the Secretariat and uh, head emeritus of that Secretariat uh, of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, which is the uh, only Global Health Treaty adopted under WHO's auspices so far. Uh, so indeed, the negotiations for a pandemic instrument to confront future pandemics have already started. And the governmental negotiating body just started its work. Negotiations are planned for another two years. And since we are in the early stage, I think it's important, and there are many issues raised around several questions which need clarity or better understanding or better common understanding to pave the way for negotiations. Uh, to me, there are three trios of questions Three groups of questions, and I, I systematize them in, in a way there are three or so questions which concern different aspects of the process, content, scope, etc., of a future pandemic instrument. And let me try to shed light on them. The first three of the questions is about the type of the instrument, the terms in use the scope, and a bit also historical perspective. So the first question of this first trio to me is, uh, which is often asked, why we are hearing so many different terms, treaties, agreements, conventions, are they the same? Are they interchangeable? The short answer is yes, they are interchangeable. If you look at the for example, the WHO's constitution, it refers to conventions and agreements. If you look at the UN Charter, it refers to treaties and agreements. But in fact, most UN treaties are called conventions. That's why in a multilateral context, yes, these three terms, treaty, convention, agreement, are used interchangeably. Although we have to be very careful that in some countries, in some national legal systems, maybe different interpretations of them, but they don't change the multilateral meaning. A second very interesting question uh, normally asked is, so this is not, not the first time uh, health community, international health community is trying to adopt a convention or treaty on health. There was a, a strain of health conventions before WHO, before even WHO was created. There are several conventions on infectious diseases particularly. Why then this new treaty raises so many questions? Uh, the answer is uh, that there are at least three critical differences between the pre-WHO conventions on infectious diseases and the new one which is being considered now. The first interesting, uh, important difference is that those treaties uh, were those early conventions were negotiated and adopted on well-known specific diseases like cholera, plague, yellow fever, etc. While this pandemic treaty will address uh, events of unknown origins. Uh, second interesting difference is that if you look at back, uh, those early conventions were mostly focused on controlling the spread of international spread of disease from the east and from the south to the north and to the west. But this type of you know categorization is obsolete in our geopolitical new realities of the 21st century. It's not anymore just one direction. So it's really a, a global issue. Um, and there is also the third difference. 
while the, these other conventions, the, the early conventions, were really the sole and dominant uh, international law at that time for infection diseases, infectious diseases. In contrast, the pandemic treaty will not be in the vacuum. The pandemic treaty will work in an in a environment of already existing other international treaties, not necessarily on health, but in other areas like trade, environment, human rights, etc., which are not health treaties, but they have a strong impact on health issues in particular in general and on infectious diseases in particular. That's why uh, the difference is that this new pandemic treaty needs to take into account existing network of other international treaties. What will be the relations between the, a, a possible future pandemic treaty, the proposed treaty, and the existing international health regulations? Because we already have IHR which were designed to control the spread of international, international spread of disease. But for this particular reason, when it came to COVID and the pandemic of this magnitude, well, they were really not sufficient. They didn't work. So that's why we had this chaos. Now, assuming that uh, there are two questions here, of course. Uh, uh, first of all, are there issues which the new treaty could resolve beyond the IHR? Clearly, would be would, would better answer than, for example, an amended international regulations. The answer is yes. And there are four issues here. Two of them are largely discussed and accepted. One is political. I think there is no debate anymore about that, that a treaty, a convention, which goes to the parliament, et cetera, which will have, will have a much higher political uh, acceptance and much higher political attention and profile compared with international health regulations, which are mostly seen as a technical instrument under the domain of the health ministry. And this will also play a role when it comes to higher attention to the compliance. There is also a good understanding that uh, there is this institutional benefit because when you have a treaty, a convention, then you normally also create a, a governing body for that treaty. So there is a possibility to have a, a dedicated governing body to govern the treaty. While, for example, the IHR is not governed by the dedicated body. It is governed by the World Health Assembly, which is a universal body. But there are also two other issues which are important, but not very well spoken or discussed. One is the legal one. Uh, legally, uh, the conventions require ratification. And ratification is uh, ratification in the parliament is mostly uh, uh, intersectoral, multisectoral, and the political process. And after the ratification, you also have the cascade of national laws to follow. This is not the case with the IHR, because IHR doesn't require ratification. That is the big difference between IHR and the possible treaty. And because there is no requirement for ratification, this parliamentary mechanism doesn't work necessarily in the way it should. And uh, there is also a um, benefit in terms of the multisectorality or multisectoral appeal, because this cascade of national laws will concern all relevant sectors, not just the health ministry. It's, it's a big difference compared, compared with the international health regulations, which are mostly seen as a legal instrument, but still under the responsibility of the health ministry, mostly. And that creates, of course, a narrow perception and narrow commitment also. The last trio of questions concerns about the content about other international treaties and about fragmenting or consolidating the field. And the first question of this last trio is which substantive issues could the treaty resolve beyond the international other regulations? I have to say there are two groups of such substantive issues. 
One group is those which are largely already discussed. So and there is no much debate about that. There, are, there is debate how to ensure that, but there is no debate much about whether it's needed or not. Uh, that is one health, zoonotic spillover. Uh, this is one, one question. Second is the, the sharing of pathogens and genetic materials. The third is the supply chain and equitable access to vaccines and other vital products. And the fourth is, of course, stronger mechanisms for compliance. And in addition, there are several issues which are of a cross-cutting ma manner, like human rights, multi-sectoral appeal, etc., which will be reflected in the treaty. But there is also uh, there are also uh, uh, four other issues which are I think not less important, but they are not discussed largely at this stage. And that's why possibly they will need more attention. First of all, it's uh, the health service preparedness, as I said, beyond the public health capacities. And public health capacities, requirements for public health capacities already are covered in the IHR, but the other health sector beyond public health capacity is not. So this is a very important issue with the pandemic treaty could think, uh, the negotiators could think of, and possibly, why not, for example, you know, to introduce requirements for minimal national capacities uh, for a broader health sector, including the hospital sector, uh, in, in the same way like the IHR contains minimal national preparedness capacities for a public health system. The second is the global rules for mobility measures. The third is social and economic response. One might think that social economic matters are outside of the health, how the pandemic treaty under WHO could address them. But as I said, social economic factors are strong determinants of health. So if you look at social economic response, not just as outside of the health sector issue, but as an issue which is reflected in health and is impacting health. In that case, it's difficult to say that these are not related to health because we know how the social and economic disruptions will, you know, deepen the, uh, the, the problems caused by the pandemics and the, unless there are at least minimal social safety nets or financial support, etc., etc. And finally, legal backup to a global financing mechanism. The problem is that many financial mechanisms are being now discussed, but without any relation to a treaty, this may create a, a dissonance in governance issues. Because if you have a you know a separate stream of, of financial measures and separate stream of legal measures without any financial backup, and the financial issues without legal backup by a treaty, this may not go well in the international for international governance of pandemics. That's why somehow you know, financial mechanisms should be linked to the treaty discussions. Not necessarily be under the treaty, but somehow linked to the treaty. And there are many international experiences in other international treaties, environment, etc., when these issues were solved and these examples can be looked at. And the final question of the final trio is the following, which is very often asked. Would the new instrument bring fragmentation to the field? or possibly even consolidation to the field? Because legitimately people are asking if you have a new instrument, then it's, you know, one more instrument and possibly to the fragmentation in parallel with the existing instruments, etc. I would say, um, uh, you know, you have to be very careful about fragmentation, but also not overestimate that issue. For example, one you know, important issue of possible fragmentation is that, yes, a treaty will require time that the countries join in because you know, the countries need to ratify them. It doesn't, you know, appear in the same time as, for example, in IHR because IHR enters into force same time for the whole countries, but it doesn't go with ratifications. In this case, you you need ratification. It takes time, but but after all, you know, the other side is that when you achieve achieve a ratification, then you achieve a stronger instrument and a more sustainable instrument and to a stronger multi-sectoral field. So we have to think, you know, whether it's, 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 it's better to have quicker, but not that strong, or a bit longer, but really strong. And another fragmentation fear is that 
if you adopt the framework convention, then the protocols will fall, negotiating with protocols, you know, which will cover very important issues, so will take time. Yes, that's a legitimate fear uh, uh, towards fragmentation. Uh, particularly protocols also may not be accepted universally by all the countries, but, you know, to fight this issue, it will be important, and this is possible, some other cities show, to negotiate and to agree on the timing of the protocols in advance during the treaty, mother treaty negotiations, rather than waiting for it. So if you have, if you have a agreed scope and timeline of the protocols to be negotiated, at the time when you negotiate the mother convention, this issue can, you know, can be solved. And the third issue of the fragmentation is, of course, uh, that, uh, the governing body will be separate of the treaty from the Earth Health Assembly. Yeah, clear fragmentation possibly. But yes, that's true. But in the meantime, it will be a dedicated governing body, which will really look at, at that particular issue with more security and uh, most likely more efficiently than the universal governing body, which overlooks all health matters, including the pandemics. But there are also issues which possibly are linked to not fragmentation, but consolidation. For example, a treaty can create a, a legal umbrella for many parallel in initiatives which are now going on in WHO, in financial institutions, etc. They are, you know, they are they are going in parallel. But when there is a treaty, treaty could create a common legal umbrella for this possibly fragmenting issues and kind of you know even even fighting. A, fragmentation, you know, which might occur if there is no one common legal umbrella. And the second is that, uh, you know, you can expect harmonized national laws to follow after ratification and and, uh, and the stronger multi-sectoral appeal, because if you just don't rely on the health sector again, it may not work. But if you have a multi-sectoral commitment, a multi-sectoral compliance, which a treaty through the ratification and through the cascade of national law could ensure, that will really help with consolidation of the food. So the answer is that there are fears of fragmentation, but that should not be overestimated in my view. But there are also uh, you know, arguments for consolidation, which should also not be underestimated in my view. Thank you.